Hello, and welcome back to this quarter's Food Systems Seminar. And the focus of this seminar, as you all know, is growing resilience and equity food systems amidst the dual pandemics of COVID-19 and systemic racism. I'm so pleased to be back here with you. As you all know, my name is Yona Sipos. I'm the seminar instructor, and I am really looking forward to introducing our guest speakers for the day. But before I do, as per usual, we have just a few announcements, and we'll start with our land and labor acknowledgement, as we do every week. Um, we begin with an Indigenous land acknowledgement to recognize and take responsibility that we are um, that we, Seattle and the University of Washington sits on traditional, ancestral and unceded Coast Salish territory of the Duwamish, Muckleshoot, Tulalip, Suquamish tribes and nations who are still here among others. Last week, you'll recall that we added a labor acknowledgement to center and lift up the too often invisible work of BIPOC communities, Black, Indigenous, people of color, whose labor is often overrepresented in our food system, but whose labor and stewardship through slavery, unpaid labor, and underpaid labor has and continues to build up the wealth and prosperity of this land, including for uninvited settlers. So continuing with this focus on land, I wanted to bring to your attention something that hopefully you had a chance to already review in the readings and that I know our speakers will touch on as well. And that is the tremendous land loss that has been experienced by the African-American communities in this country over the last hundred years. So in 1910, one in seven farmers were African-American with titles to almost 20 million acres of farmland. Over the next century, from 1910 to now 2020, 90% of black owned farmland was lost in the United States, in large part due to systematic discrimination by the USDA and other farm programs. This is something that is important to know and to dig into, to understand the systemic ra racism that has contributed to this lack of land within African-American communities. I encourage you to keep learning about this very important issue. So next I'll turn my attention, of course, to the very big news um, that finally unfolded this past weekend after a very big and stressful week that lasted into the weekend. We now have a new presumed president and vice president elect, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. The politics around the election are ongoing, <laughs> and I encourage you to watch the news closely, both to see what the new administration will roll out within their three priority areas of COVID recovery, climate change, and racial justice, but also to keep digging into how voting happened in this country. So last year, I mentioned that the youth vote uh, seem to be surging, the youth turnout seem to be surging. And this week, I want to dig into that just a tiny bit by pointing out that when we talk about youth ages 18 to 29, um, this is, of course, a huge and diverse category of people within the country. And so you have here um, some graphs from the Associated Press over the weekend showing the range of how different youth groups voted for the election. And you can see that uh, youth of color from African American communities, uh, Asian communities, and Latinx communities voted overwhelmingly for the Democratic ticket, while the white, the white youth vote was really split down the middle. So just to say that um, I encourage you to really dig into questions of demographics in this country and see how our um, our different communities are being involved in our democratic processes and contributing to them as well. The stress of the election may still be ongoing for many people, so I just wanted to post these resources again. Um, the number to the UW Counseling Center is posted, as well as a reminder that next week is a wellness week for the university, and so there will be lots of opportunities for resources, for connection, and to continue growing your personal resilience to get through this and other stressful times. 
A reminder that we are bringing back the reflection submission this week after a week off. And so for Nutrition 400 students, the reflection is due Thursday before midnight as usual. Um, instructions are posted online. So please go there first if you have questions. And just a, a reminder that only your top five submissions um, will be included in your final assessment. And then I think, um, uh, just a reminder that for Nutrition 500 students, keep on taking those notes and we look forward to reading your final summary at the end of the quarter. So with all of my announcements out of the way, I get to turn my attention to our speakers for today. And it is really such a pleasure and honor to introduce our speakers um, on the topic of growing a more sustainable, equitable future for communities of color. And we have with us two, uh, two speakers. Um, Ray Williams is the director of the Black Farmers Collective. And Hannah, Will Hannah Wilson is the program manager with Yes Farm, which is one of several uh, exciting projects of the Black Farmers Collective. There's so much more to say, but I know that Ray and Hannah are going to be adding some more to their introductions. And so with that, I'm just going to say thank you so much for being with us. It's really exciting to have a chance to learn from you. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to you both. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the introduction. I will start sharing my screen now. All right, we can get started. Um, today, we will be talking about the Black Farmers Collective and the work we're doing in our communities. And yeah, thanks for having us. Take it away, Ray. Uh, hi, I'm, uh, I'm Ray Williams. I'm the director, um, one of the founding members of the Black Farmers Collective. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I want to. I, I just want to thank uh, Dr. Yona for having us uh, on today, and um, and also in her sharing, centering this idea about health and um, you know mental health and the stress around this. I think that's that's really one of the reasons I got into um, this work was to to uh, <clears throat> um, because I felt this was a, a, a way to help heal um, the the community, right? Um, so yeah, I'm, you know, my pronouns are he or his. Um, I'm mixed race, I identify as African American, and I was uh, born in Seattle. Uh, my folks moved out here um, from the East Coast. Uh, my dad's black and my mom was white. And when they got married, it was legal in New York where they got married, but it was not legal in the state of Virginia. Um, and we have the, um, you know, Loving versus Virginia sort of Supreme Court. Um, case that happened after they were married. So we, they moved to Seattle for a, a more uh, um, liberal space to, to raise their family. I have a couple of brothers that are, um, and we all still live in, in the Seattle area. Um, so I'm a, you know, as I'm a, I'm a really a science teacher as a profession, but um, I really spent the last years really trying to grow and develop um, some learning spaces from gardens. I mean, my last posting was at the Art Institute. I, I taught nutrition and biology. And I built, and at that time, I, I really was uh, sort of solidified the idea that, you know, what we eat is directly um, connected to our health, um, uh, uh, how healthy we are and how, how long we live. And, and so um, I came with this idea that, that um, you know, one of the best things you can do to improve your health is to eat better. And one of the best things to do for eating better is, is to grow some of your own food. I think it's also the act of growing food connects you with the land. Um, um, you can share, um, share with other folks what you're doing. It brings a, a larger community. It gets out, you get you out in nature. Uh, certainly there's stress release, a uh, relief uh, of doing that. And then for me, it's, it's become this great opportunity to, um, to meet lots of young folks and, and try to develop um, youth leadership in the farm. And, and here's a picture of me um, by, by one of the sunflowers we planted earlier over at Yes Farm. So um, I guess I'll turn it over to Hannah. Thank you. Let's see. 
Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Hannah Wilson. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the Yes Farm manager. Um, so basically, just a little bit more about me. Um, I identify as a queer, deaf, disabled, mixed race Black woman. And I think it's really important for me to put that out there because it really informs the way that I do my work and like walk through this world and um, how I sort of um, invite the community into the farm space and how I do my work with Black Farmers Collective. Um, I was born and raised on Olone territory, aka the Bay Area. And uh, while I was in California, I think I saw a lot of sort of the exploitation of the land and the people in terms of agriculture. Um, I saw a lot of, you know, migrant labor work and a lot of um, environmental exploitation in terms of uh, droughts and, and pollution via different types of fertilizer, pesticides and herbicides. And so I think that really informs um, sort of the beginnings of me looking into um, doing farm work and um, yeah. And then, and I came to Seattle uh, after I graduated high school and I knew I wanted to do environmental work um, and I ended up majoring in environmental science and geography at the University of Washington. Um, and while I was there, um, I took a class in environmental justice in the geography department. And that's where I really sort of uh, learned about, you know, food justice and urban ecosystems and, and the way that that is all tied together um, with food systems. Um, yeah, and then, you know, the reason why I do this work is because nurturing the land and growing food and restoring uh, native ecosystems with others has just been incredibly healing and um, has brought me a lot of knowledge and a way to like take care of myself and others. And I find it very regenerative and it also allows me and everyone that I work with to be really imaginative about the world that we can live in and the ways that we can serve others and ourselves. So, especially in a system that has, you know, wanted us to be disconnected from food and the land and each other, um, as well as a system that has uh, caused a lot of trauma to people of color and, and made it inaccessible for us to be connected with the land and food. So yeah, we will go in a little bit more about who the Black Farmers Collective is. Um, I can take this. Um, the Black Farmers Collective is a mutual aid network of Black-led regenerative farms in partnership with other BIPOC farmers, organizers, and leaders creating a food system for healthier communities. We believe the key to a more sustainable, equitable future for communities of color requires addressing food insecurity and fighting for food sovereignty. Our two sites include Yes Farm and Four Acres located out in Woodenville, both of which are part of our efforts for land acquisition, BIPOC farmer development, community building, educational programs, and growing food. And I'll turn it over to Ray to sort of talk about the origins of the Black Farmers Collective. Um, thanks, Hannah. So we're, um, we started as an organization, actually, um, uh, when we were in the process of applying to, to be able to farm Yes Farm. So Yes Farm is a, a, is a one and a half acre site. It's actually the freeway right away, um, right by I-5 downtown, um, just south of Yesler. And so um, Seattle Housing Authority had put out a, a request for proposals about who might want to turn this space into an urban farming site. Um, we had a meeting of some of the local activists and started working on that project. And in the, in the course of that um, uh, work on the project, we developed the name Black Farmers Collective. And we were able to secure actually uh, five years ago, the right to, to uh, start this project. Um, this would be a, a, a no-cost lease on the freeway right of way through the Washington Department of Transportation. And it took about uh, three years for Seattle Housing and WashDOT to get it together. 
to get all the paperwork uh, together. Um, we then were able to get the proper farm insurance and um, get the keys to the land two years ago. So two years ago, it was uh, um, uh, a grass and weeds and blackberry filled fields uh, with some trees. And over the last couple of years, we've been able to develop it into the start of an urban farm. And you'll see some pictures and we'll describe some of our projects there. You know, I think our original reason to, to get together was um, we were actually at some meetings around how can uh, the efforts to grow some of your own food, how can we support folks in their efforts to grow some of their own food in the face of increasing gentrification in the central area? You know, folks, um, I would say back in the day, and we'll look at history a bit, did grow some of their food in, in backyard gardens. Um, you know, gentrification not only forces the, the folks that live there out, in this case in the central area, sort of displacing African-American residents. Um, and it also displaces places to grow food because you have more density and it displaces nature. So in this way, um, we feel that Yes Farm is, is, is a little bit of an anchor for the black community to be able to stay in, in this central area. Um, and, and also a space for, for nature to stay in, uh, in the central area. And so that's why we're developing the farm, um, not only for uh, economic development and food production, but we also have a section for uh, community building around the community garden. And then actually Hannah is uh, starting a project um, this week around natural habitat restoration. So we're, um, um, that's a little bit of the history of, of how we got where we are, uh, and we'll share more in a bit. All right, so before we go into our individual projects that we have, um, we wanted to provide some context as to why we feel it's so crucial that we are doing this work. Um, Yona definitely uh, touched on this, but you know, 0.52% of farmland is owned by black farmers today, um, which is, I think is down you know, over 95% from 1920. Um, I grabbed a couple quotes from, from articles and they say, you know, there were nearly a million black farmers in 1920 and today there's only 45,000. Um, and I found it really interesting in this NPR article how they mentioned that more than half of all black people in America lived on farms, mostly in the South. Um, and in comparison, only one quarter of white Americans lived on farms across the United States. Um, yeah, so I think there's just a, you know, an image that we have of farming in America that is not really aligned with reality, for sure. Um, Ray uh, was talking about this, so I'll let him share this quote of his. Right. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Hannah. I think, um, you know, we're working on urban farms um, and, and peri-urban farms now. And in our work, I think, um, you know, around food justice, um, it, you know, it started to become aware that actually access to land was really the, the real limiting factor um, in, in some of the, um, you know, and I think in our, our communities being able to be whole in terms of that, to be able to be to, to be producers, to be able to, um, again, grow a bit of our own food, but also have a, a little bit of a control of our food system. And I think all farmers have fallen into this trap of, um, uh, of the large, more and larger and larger industrial farms. Um, and so, and, and then also the debt that the financial system you know, puts on, puts on farmers. Um, farmers now have to go into a great, a great amount of debt spend a lot of time trying to pay off that debt in the end, you know, have actually very um, small salaries for it, for the amount of work they do. So I think for us, for us, it, um, liberation would be having land, but then getting out of the underneath the financial system um, that, that controls us. Uh, and so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to 
um, have, get access to land, whether it's by leasing, which is what we're doing right now, or looking to purchase land, but also set up a system that you don't have to get a loan in order to do your job um, and sort of cut the banks out of this. So we're we're hoping that that's part of our future, and we're doing it again by by trying to um, get land for folks. Um, to offer education around um, the farming on that land um, and just try to remove as many barriers as we can to young farmers that, that want to get out there and start to help being the real producers in our community. Yeah, one thing I wanted to mention too is that I think that the Black community is really seeing uh, the importance of getting back to the land and getting back to farming and sort of the the sovereignty that it gives our community to be able to do that. Um, so we can see like within the past 20 years, um, the rate of the number of new black farmers or the number of black farmers has increased pretty dramatically. Um, and so it, you know, we are part of this movement and increase of black farmers and, and part of our work with the Black Farmers Collective is to try to train new farmers and train new growers um, so that they can be a part of this as well. Um, obviously there's a long way to go, but um, we can see that there's a positive trend overall with black farmers. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to go a little bit more into what the specific goals of the Black Farmers Collective is. Um, I know Ray touched on this a little bit, but, you know, first off, like providing food education and community building in the neighborhood and, and surrounding communities, um, improving community health, um, you know, acknowledging the fact that food apartheid and um, just the limited access to healthy food and land and green space has uh, created a disparity in the health between uh, communities of color and white people. Um, yeah, and, and having access to those things will improve our community health. Um, the other thing that we're focusing on is uplifting and generating black leadership. Our entire board is, is black, all of the folks that we pay um, in our in our staff are black, so it's definitely been very cool to see sort of the intentionality within the Black Farmers Collective to support that. Um, our you know one of our main new efforts is actually training new BIPOC farmers in our new space in Woodenville, um, while also giving that opportunity at Yes Farm and our other gardening spaces on a smaller scale. One other thing that we are really honing in on is uh, facilitating the sharing of cultural traditions. Uh, it's very important to us that we are making sure that our food is culturally relevant and, and, and suits you know, the very diverse BIPOC community that we have here in Seattle and also allowing for space for um, you know, different traditions, whether it's a ceremony um, on the land and, and other ways of uh, gathering for different communities. Um, creating access to land and then uh, land stewardship, including the restoration of pollinator habitat and healthy ecosystems across the urban and peri-urban landscape in the greater Seattle area, um, especially honoring the, you know, original stewards of our land and and the knowledge that they have around that is, is a priority of ours. And then finally, just striving for food justice and food sovereignty is what the Black Farmers Collective does. So the next thing that we're gonna talk about is sort of what we see as our, our roles in the food system. And just, we, we generally ask people to think about the ways that they, um, participate in this food system. And I think that y'all have all seen this graph or something very similar and, and can sort of think about the ways that you're a consumer and maybe even a producer of food. Um, but I also encourage y'all to think about sort of what may be missing from this graph. Um, I think it should, you know, 
be also included that we are doing education and, and mutual aid and, and developing leadership within food systems, you know, whether it's as a teacher or organizer or whatever it may be. And then also just talking about the, the barriers to each of these steps in the food system, whether it's, you know, just the cost of organic food and, and you know, where food is available for, for folks. And then, the, you know, of course, you know, access to land for farmers as well. Um, and then we also really encourage people to reflect on sort of what are the ways that you can shorten your food chain and sort of create a you know, more hyper-localized food system for yourself and, and for your community. Um, here, we, we love this infographic. I think it really spells out the way that, um, you know, we, we add a lot of steps to our food system when we are sort of more disconnected from it. So if we're growing food from our home garden, you know, that's, you know, garden to plate immediately. Um, and then all the way down to, you know, food delivery service. There's, there's so many ways that this food is um, changing hands and, and we don't know where this food comes from all the time. And, and it, you know, it prevents us from knowing what it means to, to eat this food and, and all of that. Um, yeah, Ray, do you have anything to add to this part? Um, you know, I guess I'll comment on the last couple of slides if we can, if we can think about that and you certainly don't have to move them back. Um, you know, one of the things that I think, I think I want to share is when I, when I look at the folks who are, um, working in the urban food gardens and urban garden systems, I see a lot more diversity. I think the, the, the overall management, um, um, has been done by white led organizations, um, large organizations, but on the ground, lots and lots of farmers of color, um, in urban spaces. And so I think the idea that for some reason, uh, black and brown people don't want to be farm managers, um, out in the rural, um, spaces is, is not true. It, it's more a case of, of where folks are welcome. And so we're hoping to create enough, um, an, enough, uh, farmers that are um, and support them in the more rural areas and understand that they're going to need uh, colleagues out there and a support system in order to be successful in what has you know traditionally been a you know a stronghold for for some folks that would rather keep the um, the neighborhood and the communities uh, pretty wide out there so i think that's a piece that we're starting to see in that it's not a, a lack of um, desire to be on the land, it, it may more be a lack of desire to work for somebody else, whereas there's a, a, a desire to be your own boss and have some sovereignty and also some safety out there is a, is a point I, I think I wanted to, uh, I wanted to add to. Um, yeah, thank you. So yeah, um, you know, the food system, I think we're, we're, you know, when I look at this chart of the food system, I, I, I start to think of the old days when farmers would bring food into the, into the city um, and, and folks would buy that food. And then, um, you know, stores started buying food um, from farmers and selling it to, to the people in their neighborhood. And that was uh, uh, still a way that everybody in the neighborhoods got, got uh, you know, got their foods through these stores and then through grocery stores and then supermarkets. Um, and I think it wasn't really until the sort of um, business end got into the supermarket thing where all the local supermarkets were bought up by larger supermarket chains. Um, and in that, it, it was at that time that then all these stores were owned by the same set of folks. Uh, and then they could start looking at um, profit margins and also what communities they wanted to serve. And so some of those then larger supermarkets uh, got closed in communities, uh, mostly communities of color, whether the, the folks thought that they couldn't make as much money there or, or whether they just decided they would, would rather not be in those communities. And so we, this is the food system that we have now where 
there's um, you know not a lot of good access in in many communities of color. It just didn't wasn't a natural thing. It, it actually happened over the course of the development from the small farmer um, selling to the fo- to their to folks uh, into our industrial food system. So I think that's something to think about. You know what steps uh, in all of these food systems um, that we're looking at here. Uh, contributed to this disparity in the number of farmers. And I guess I'd also um, focus on uh, the food processing, because as we got larger and larger and and, um, looked at food as more of a commodity, uh, we started growing more commodity foods and we did more processing. And I think one of the efforts that the Black Farmers Collective has, and a lot of local folks is, is is to try to explain to people and share with people that actually processed food is not very good for you. And so if you can somehow short circuit this system and not have to depend on so much processed food, then that's gonna, that's really gonna help you. So um, I, I think those are some of the things, I think maybe my uh, nutrition um, you know, education has, has started to look at this, this slide and, and talk about it and, and try, to, try to use it as a way to talk about what's working uh, in the system, what's not working, um, how you personally can short circuit some of this for your own health, how you can uh, in your small community short circuit this um, for your community's health. And then, um, you know, if you've got the energy, um, you step into the larger, um, state and national level in in terms of trying to work for uh, uh, a better food system, a more just food system that that's going to lead to a a much healthier community and an overall, um, you know, lower health care costs and and raise the quality of life. So a couple of things that came to me while Hannah was explaining, um, explaining what's going on. So thanks, Hannah, for, for bringing that up for me. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, before we go into our um, projects, we're going to go over some important terms um, that definitely shape the way that we do our work and educate folks. Um, the first term is food apartheid. Um, I definitely like always want to mention that food apartheid and food desert uh, are not the same thing. Um, I think that food deserts are a widely used term that sort of makes it so that the inaccessibility to food in low income and uh, communities of color is a is a natural occurring phenomenon um, and that there's not really necessarily a reason behind it. It's just that it just naturally happens. Um, and I think that food apartheid really touches on the fact that it is a systemic an intentional um, phenomenon. Um, So this is a a definition that we found online. um, And it's, you know, it touches on the fact that food apartheid takes into account income, race, and geography, and the inequities between all of that. Um, Ray touched on this, the fact that grocery store owners tend to build in neighborhoods where people have money to spend. And so they rarely end up in low income neighborhoods. And then the food that are available in these low income neighborhoods tend to be unhealthy and processed food, which leads to uh, food related illnesses such as diabetes, hypertension, and heart disease. And then I think, you know, another thing that I really like about this definition is that, um, that food deserts or food apartheid is sort of a, you know, symptom of a lack of resources and that these communities do know how to feed themselves and do know how to serve themselves when they are given the resources and not deprived of them. Um, You know, I think that this is something Ray and I talk about a lot is that like the Black Farmers Collective and Yes Farm and our various different projects are sort of a model of like Black creativity and imagination and and genius within a system that doesn't really want us to, you know, show that. Um, And then the next definition I'm going to talk about is food sovereignty. Um, Ray, jump in whenever you want. Um, But yeah, I think like 
defining the def, you know, defining food security, food justice, and food sovereignty is really important in these conversations that we're having. Um, La Via Campesina is a really uh, crucial labor rights movement uh, happening in Latin America. And they define food sovereignty as the right of each nation to maintain and develop its own capacity to produce its basic foods, respecting cultural and productive diversity. Um, and that food sovereignty is a precondition to genuine, genuine food security. Um, and I think that, you know, Food security is the first step, you know, it, but it fails to sort of acknowledge the, the holistic wellness of communities and, and only focuses on the availability and prices of food, but not necessarily the nutritional value um, and other, you know, ways that food serves us. Um, and food sovereignty also incorporates the rights of people to define their own agricultural, labor, fishing, food, and land policies that are ecologically, socially, economically, and culturally appropriate to their circumstances. Um, yeah. So now, we'll so about, yeah, go for just it. Just a bit about food sovereignty. Go for it. So you know, I'm right. I'm you know, I'm, I'm thinking this on a on a sort of a larger scale as well. I mean, part of um, colonialism and oppression has been to to um, reduce the food sovereignty of, of, of many nations. And I think where we see this now uh, under the guise of, of the idea that we're running out of food and so uh, big corporate farms need to take over the farming um, in large areas of the world, you know, especially Africa, in order to be um, that is now the world that small farmers continue to um, they need technical assistance in a lot of places. Um, but I think this food sovereignty is is really directly connected to national sovereignty, uh, and and um, the history of of colonial colonialism in, includes the the reduction of food sovereignty as a way to to um, to really put a, a noose around the neck of, of folks that you want to um, try to subdue, and so um, um, we, you know, we're 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 not assuming that the Black Farmers Collective is going to change the industrial food system in the United States, right? But I think it's important to understand that food and and how food is grown around the world is is a fight that is going on right now, and so large interests um, are very interested in. Uh, making uh, the um, industrial um, heavily um, uh, uh, industrial farming, relying on chemicals, relying on lots and lots of inputs uh, to produce uh, produce food, rather than the the more natural um, ways that indigenous folks have have grown food. Um, well, you know, for the last hundred thousand years, I suppose, um, maybe not quite that long. So. Um, you know, we find ourselves on, on a small little piece of, of a much larger fight with lots of different connections. And, and as I, I may be speaking to the students here, um, when you're thinking about that, you don't necessarily have to, uh, I would encourage you to broaden your, your look at uh, how food is really connected um, with the history of the world. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Ray. I think another thing that we talk about a lot is how scarcity is sort of a constructed idea you know we have you know not that much land but we have produced an abundance of food from our just urban farm spaces and of course it's not enough to feed everyone uh in seattle but it is certainly a lot of food and um just kind of goes to show that um our land can give to us in abundance when we nurture it um so yeah just now we will go into some of our projects. Um, yes, Farm is up first. So these first few pictures are sort of uh, pictures from the beginning of this year. Um, we have on the left here, sort of the beginnings of our hoop house. And on, in the middle, we have one of our first uh, big volunteer days. 
and you can see how grassy it is. And on the right, I have a sort of funny picture of me with the, the weed whacker ready to <laughs> develop this land <laughs> into a growing space. And then now um, our farm is a lot more developed. We put in a lot of work digging and, and you know, bringing folks into the space to help us out and, and turn it into a way more productive space. And it's very beautiful and, and really cool to be a part of. And, and it's very satisfying to see the, the quick development of the space for sure. Um, so the layout is very interesting. Um, we are sort of tucked in between some major uh, busy places in Seattle. So you can see on the left here, we have I-5 just hugging along the, the left side of this green rectangle. And then up above, we have some uh, Yesler Terrace housing and right behind it is uh, Harborview, which is a major medical center with uh, you know, incoming trauma helicopters all the time. It's, and then on the right, we have some more uh, housing and we have the Yesler Terrace Community Center. Um, and there's like a, a park and a playground. And, and so that's, you know, that's continued green space from the farm as well. And then on the very right of us, we have uh, some large development, which you can't really see from this picture, but um, it is, you know, a lot of those trees are just gone um, now and they're building uh, some towers of luxury apartments right there. And then to the south, we have um, more of uh, the international district area. And so this, the farm is very long and narrow. Um, we have about like 700 feet of uh, space and it's about hundred feet wide and it's, it's very sloped. Um, it's flatter towards the top, um, but going slightly downhill. And then uh, it definitely starts to get steeper as you go towards, uh, as you go more south on the farm. And uh, sort of before we go into all the stuff that we've done at the farm, we also want to make sure that we acknowledge the history of the land that we're on, because it's very, it's very complicated and, and, and definitely informs the work that we do. So I think Ray touched on this a little bit, but currently the land is a um, partnership between Seattle Housing Authority, Washington Department of Transportation, and the Yesler community on a freeway right of way next to I-5. But before us, um, you know, this land was stewarded by the Coast Salish peoples, specifically the Duwamish tribe since time immemorial. And then in 1851, colonizers arrived and the Seattle governance was established in 1869. Um, in 1861, the first black settlers arrived in Seattle. And then not long after that, there was a native exclusion ordinance that made it so that native folks could not be present in the Seattle area or own land in the Seattle area. Um, and then um, one of the major sort of like black leaders early on in Seattle was William Gross, and he purchased 12 acres of land from Henry Yesler in what is now the central district in Seattle. And uh, it is important to note that Yes Farm is on Yesler Way and, and named after Henry Yesler. Um, and then um, in the 1920s and 40s, there were racially restrictive covenants otherwise known as redlining, discriminating against black people and in, you know, in terms of owning houses and land um, and, and restricting them to the central district in Seattle. Um, it's also important to know that Yesler Terrace was home to the original Skid Row. It's at the top of a large hill and they, they would like chop down trees and, and throw it down the hill, throw logs down the hill essentially. And then later on it was a uh, home to Japantown. Um, and then it became, and then Yesler Terrace specifically, that area became the first integrated subsidized housing project 
in the country in the 60s. Um, and then uh, not long after that, I-5 was built and definitely broke up the International District and the Yeslo Terrace Housing Project, um, making it smaller. And um, yes, the area that Yes Farm is specifically on became a walking path between Jackson and Yesler and was, is a place and was a place for uh, unhoused folks to live. Is there anything else you want to touch on, Ray? No, I think that's great. Thanks. I think I think the, the last piece is important, you know, because, and again, there's been a history of folks that are living on the land. And we, you know, personally, I, I got into this, I mentioned that um, we're trying to stop displacement. But then when you get there, you realize that in some ways we're displacing some of these folks that, that used, to, um, used to camp and live on the land. And so um, I think the the original plan was to, to seal it off and, um, you know, just try to have it as a farm. But now we realize that when you, when you move into a space, you realize folks have been using this as a, uh, as a walkway uh, since the freeway went, went in. So, um, you know, we're continuing that. And so we're able to have interactions with, uh, with folks that live in Yeser Terrace that are, that are farming, but also folks that are unhoused, living up the hill or around, you know, as they use it as a as a pathway. And so I think that's a, a whole nother issue we can we can get into. Sort of the um, you know urban farming happens on um, often um, underutilized land, and that's where also folks are staying, right? And so we're we're we really um, in an interesting connection that I've found in in my ten years of working working um you know on urban farms is it definitely gets you closer to the gets you closer to the people yeah yeah definitely i think we've had a lot of conversations about how we can share resources with those folks who are living on the land or nearby and and how we can mm -hmm. generate a more positive relationship and and not one of you know this is our land not for you type situation um, there, our main goals at Yes Farm are to serve as a community connector through interactions between diverse residents in the community garden space. And then we also want to provide for economic development in the larger farm co-op space. Um, and then the way that we do a lot of sort of connecting with our community is through educational programming and, um, you know, whether you know, virtually or on site. This year has definitely been a learning experience with that virtual aspect of that. Um, and then on the far end of the farm, we are wanting to do sort of restoration of natural ecosystems with native plants and, and also create more pollinator habitat and, and allow for more biodiversity in general. And so now we'll kind of go through some, some pictures of the last year. Um, one of the main things that we do is have volunteer days twice a week. Um, and we also, um, on the right, we can see one of our staff members, NAR, teaching a, a seed saving class, which has been really special. And, and that program also um, was centered around teaching kids how to, you know, test their soil, uh, learn what a, a bioswale is and, and what that does for water collection and what native plant restoration is and, and how to harvest food. And, and yeah, that, that was really cool. And then one, our, another thing that we're doing at the farm is growing mushrooms with our, our friend Lisa. Uh, she started like a, a little patch to grow mushrooms in using straw and, and we just covered it for a couple months and uh, later on it fruited. And then these, you know, these are some pictures from sort of the height of our, our growing season. Um, it was super abundant. Uh, a lot of these folks are, you know, either community growers, regular volunteers, um, 
our partners with EarthCore who help us, they help us with some of the, the restoration aspects and, and uh, sort of infrastructure aspect. And then we have Chanel on the far right, who is one of our farmers um, with, you know, the, the bigger economic development oriented growing space. And, and she is next year going to focus more on educational programming and, and training folks on how to process food so that we can, we can keep it for longer. Um, yeah, these are some like really cool pictures to look through looking back on it. And then, um, you know, another thing that we do a lot is uh, sort of doing community outreach. So this was an event centered around uh, healing and we were able to build a bunch of planter boxes and, and have folks reflect on what uh, healing with the land and, you know, their connection to food and their ancestors looks like and paint planter boxes and have cool discussions. And um, one of the folks I was working with made a sign called, that says farming is activism. And, and that's definitely a huge part of our work. Um, I think Ray, Ray also knows this. We've, you know, been able to connect with many grassroots organizers through our work and it definitely is abolition to be doing this work. Um, here's some more photos of people harvesting. Um, this was last week, the last day of our program. This, uh, these are some pictures of, of us finishing our outdoor classroom, putting the roof on our outdoor classroom to give us a, a covered space to, to be in the rain and and also just an intentional space for, for folks to gather. Um, and then we have some folks there. Um, one of the things that we definitely prioritize is creating space for culturally important uh, traditions and, and food. And, and last week for Dia de los Muertos, we had um, some organizers create a altar and land blessing for Yes Farm. And it was, it was very beautiful and, and special to be a part of. And um, yeah, just, we, we wanna be able to have the space for, for things like this going forward. And then, you know, the other things we um, should talk about is how our community garden was based out of a need for many folks living in the Yes or Terrace subsidized housing to, to basically reclaim growing space since the old subsidized housing all had um, yard space and, and most of those yards had gardens in them. And then now with the redevelopment, all those folks are being put into apartments that don't have um, their own personal gardening space. And so, that's definitely a, a service we've been able to, to provide. And it's been really cool to witness um, the different strategies that people use to grow their food and, and to see the different foods that are grown because it is very culturally specific. Um, so yeah, Ray, jump in whenever you want to. Um, yep, we're doing great. <laughs> we're, we're, starting to, we're starting to run out of time. Yeah, yeah, I'll keep, I'll keep going. Um, so here we have some pictures from our efforts to, to give out planter boxes so that folks could grow at home. And, and this was a partnership with One Vibe Africa um, who does a lot of work with East African families. Um, these pictures are, you know, on the left, we see our team of folks from our um, partners at Uprooted and Rising who help us with uh, getting our food out to different mutual aid efforts. And so on the right, you can see one of our food pantries and the, the beautiful produce boxes that we were able to give away to almost 200 families. Most of them um, either undocumented or Latinx day worker families or queer and trans people of color. Um, and, and, you know, we were able to also provide books and, and school supplies and some other stuff as well. So some of the challenges slash opportunities at Yes Farm are, 
you know, the very sloped geography and just where it is in between all the development and the freeway um, and how the soil is impacted by all of that. Um, right now, we know that the soil is pretty healthy to grow food in. Um, I'm definitely interested to see how that, if that changes with the developing, development happening next door. Um, the proximity of land to camping sites, freeway housing development, basically is, you know, one of our main challenges, especially with security. Um, we have to make sure that uh, we lock things down so that they don't get taken. Um, we, you know, our, our other challenge is just like maintaining the costs of everything. Um, the, the urban farm space is not next, necessarily the most uh, profitable space. And so that is also why we do so much of our, um, you know, educational programming and community development is um, that also helps us, you know, get grants and, and community uh, input as well. Um, and, you know, one of our, you know, I think this is more of an opportunity is that we're, we're quickly expanding capacity. And so like, how do we keep up with that? And, and recruit growers as we go. And moving forward, what we wanna do is develop more methodology for testing and remediation of soil, not just at Yes Farm, but around the city and provide that as a resource. Um, we wanna continuing developing more nutrition and urban farming curriculum to engage local youth and families. And we want to develop sustainable, a sustainable business model to propagate a source of income. So I encourage you all to think about what other ways we can we can do to address the community education or economic components of the Black Farmers Collective and Yes Farm. So I'll hand it over to Ray to talk about our efforts in Woodenville and Small X. Um, so thanks, Hannah. Um, we've just got a few few pictures of the space out here. So uh, King County um, for uh, actually quite a while has been buying up um, land and to try to keep it in, in agriculture rather than for development. And this piece of land that we were able to lease uh, from King County uh, is four acres on a 16 acre site. The other, the other farms have been uh, farmed um, for the last 30, 35 years by immigrant farmers, mostly among uh, farmers that are growing flowers and um, they grow a few vegetables, but because the site does not have irrigation water, that's one of the reasons that the flowers were, were um, annuals that, that could get enough water from the soil and produce in the spring and summer uh, and then come back. Um, this is a uh, show some of our uh, board members and friends out on the farm. You see a nice uh, uh, green cover crop of a uh, rye and a, a vetch, a small bean that we put down so we've been able to, in a short time, um, acquire a tractor to do the do the work that's going to be needed out on this small farm. And our, our model is to to raise up some young farmers and to produce a lot of land. So there's a there's a shot of Masra, um, you know, earlier on um, doing some mowing out there. And there's my first um, first little row of collards. As soon as we got it, I, I decided I need to put something out there. So. Um, you know, we've got that. And I actually just had some of those collards um, fried up with some potatoes and eggs for breakfast today. So um, it's very satisfying to be able to, again, grow some of your own food and and to know that what you're eating is, is fresh and good for you. Um, you know, we've done we are creating partnerships to to farm this land now. Um, we're looking at, of course, Mosser as a young uh, black farmer. We've got a um, uh, a native woman that's done some farming in another spot. Um, and so we're trying to bring in that indigenous farming and we're also, you know, opening that up to some other farmers. So we're very excited to have um, um, really the first farm um, that designed for teaching that that's run by people of color, right? That we're trying to create a space um, that folks feel safe to be able to come out and, and learn and, and develop economically. I mean, the idea is to train people, but it's also to grow food. And if you, um, in order to continue to grow food, you have to have an economic development. 
uh, plan. You have to have a farm plan so you can sell enough of that food so you can afford to be out there. And I think one of my one of my big pushes uh, in this whole food system is for folks to realize that the people that grow the food need to be compensated for that. So we uh, we we love to give away food and we have given away a lot. I think our model now is to sell it to people that want to um, either use it or or also try to pass that on and give it away. So we're we're very excited about this next step, um, which is to really move into a larger piece of that food system. Um, out here and uh, and yeah that's um you know i think we're about to the end might have a couple comments i'll, I'll pass it off to hannah uh it's just been a great adventure um trying to pull all this together yeah thank you yeah we'll just quickly breeze through some of our other community gardens that we've been working in um, this is at South Park Community Center where we were doing some micro remediation, um, which, which means basically remediating uh, toxins and pollutants out of the soil using fungi and mushrooms. Um, and then this is our space out in uh, the Central District at Wanawari, which is a black owned art gallery. And uh, you can see in the bottom right, this is what it looked like in July, and we've since uh, cleared it out, built some raised beds, harvested a ton of collards, and, and had a ton of folks out. And we, we also had a youth justice program out there. And then this is our space down in Columbia City at Africatown Center for Education and Innovation. We have some community beds and a chicken coop there, as well as uh, kind of like a, an office space for the Black Farmers Collective as well. And then this is sort of a, a new space that we found that we're gonna start pushing to have a greenhouse and chicken coop and some educational programming down in Rainier Beach. And yeah, that's, that's sort of it for the Black Farmers Collective. We wanted to leave you off with some reflection um, one thing that we think about a lot is, you know, what are our short, medium, and long-term goals for food sovereignty um, on a societal, community, and individual level? Um, I always plug that Indigenous sovereignty and Black liberation are heavily intertwined. And the way that we do that is by giving land back to Indigenous folks, um, having reparations, and abolishing um, the carceral state and, and the police. Um, and on a community level, um, we encourage folks to think about like community gardens and just a general like hyper-localized food system in your community and continuing to do land and soil restoration and building pollinator habitat and uh, contributing to decentralized mutual aid networks. And then on an individual level, you know, making sure that you are part of these mutual aid networks and donating to black and indigenous led organizations and organize with your friends um, on how to, you know, do labor for BIPOC folks and contribute to your food system. And I always love to say that people should do guerrilla gardening and, you know, ask for forgiveness later. So, yeah, I think. Thank you all for having us, and uh, this has been a pleasure, and it, it's cool to reconnect with UW postgrad for me. So, yeah. Yeah, thanks very much. You know, I think maybe we have time for a couple of questions. Um, yes. Um, Sorry, can you hear me? Hey. Now? Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was an incredible breath. Uh, that you were able to bring to us. Um, and I wish that we were in class with our students so that you could hear a whole room full of 200 students clapping and being appreciative for this gift of history and contemporary insights into uh, the forces that have really shaped um, some of the experiences of BIPOC communities, along with the possibility of you know, reframing some of the contemporary issues in a, in that um, in that framework of abundance. I really appreciate that um, scarcity to abundance that you're speaking about. 
um, gosh, you covered so much. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not, I, I, I don't even know where to go with my questions, except one, you know, just to, to again, thank you for both that, um, that narrative that kind of brought us to the contemporary times um, to celebrate what black farmers are already accomplishing, what BIPOC communities are accomplishing on the land and, and how much work there still is to do. And the incredible photos that you shared are just such an insight into how busy you've been and how productive you've been. And Ray, I got to visit you, I think at the beginning of this year and gosh, Yes Farm did not look like that in uh, early 2020. So congratulations. Yeah, and a lot of changes. Yeah, on your growing programs in, in many yeah. sites. Um, I have two questions for you and um, I wanted to really focus in on the work that you're doing with youth. I think that there's so much that you've accomplished and there's so much potential there to um, grow empowerment, grow connection, like you're saying, grow leadership. Um, and I wanted to know if you can speak a little bit about your approach to actually bringing youth to the land. How do you invite people? How do you how do you, you know, work with people who might be hesitant or have some concerns um, or just be a little skeptical about their role, you know, within the farming and the food system? So more on that, if you have more to share, please. Um, well, thanks. Thanks. I think, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, say a bit and pass it on that, that, um, you know, one of the ways that we've, well, just for the very basic, one of the ways that we've been able to make this happen is to partnership with other organizations, right? So we have partnered obviously with Seattle Housing Authority that did the um, um, uh, did the real negotiations with WashDOT in order to for us to get this land. And so we we do partner with the folks up at, at uh, Yester Terrace and Seattle Ho Housing Authority to try to advertise our opportunities, right, to get down there. Um, and so to invite families to come down and give them a space to grow, they can bring their children. I think that's that's been one way we've been able to do it. We've also partnered with other organizations that already provide educational opportunities. We partnered with iUrban Teen on it and they got it, were able to get a grant through King Conservation District to offer some direct education. And so one of the ways you motivate uh, high school kids is to give them a stipend. And so um, if you you can, you know, um, entice them with a little money, have them come down and, and trick them into learning something. I think um, when I look way back in my ninth grade science classes uh, back in the previous century, that that um, that it was really, you know, a part of that is is really trying to 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 lay a table and and trick some folks to come on on down and, and then engage. I think folks were great. So we've been able to, again, partner with other organizations. I think um, um, the, the best thing probably that I've done in terms of, of bringing youth in is to is to look at folks that can help us. We were able to hire Hannah through a partnership with Earth Corps. And so, um, you know, I count Hannah as a youth. And when you bring in folks that are young, they bring their friends. And so we've been able to uh, definitely stretch the curve to the lower uh, lower end of folks that are actually out there working and volunteering, um, you know, getting an opportunity um, to be on the land. Um, and so that's, I think, uh, you know, some of the ways we've been able to get youth out there. Um, you know, we're looking now, um, looking forward in terms of partnerships, more partnerships with educational organizations, you know, now because of the uh, restrictions put on by COVID, um, you know, face to face um, has been tough, as of course, you know, but out on the farm with our, you know, one and a half acres, it's been relatively easy to, uh, to set up social distancing. Um, you know, you quickly find out if kids are carpooling um, there, then it's OK for them to work next to each other. But we've got lots of space to work. It's an opportunity, I think, um, to expand. Certainly our relationship with the University of Washington has gotten youth out there. Um, we have um, uh, two, possibly three in interns from the School of Social Work that are going to do their practicum out there this year. So that's been great. We're, we're close to Seattle U. And so we, we got a lot of the early work done with a, uh, through a science uh, class coming down. And we continue to, to, to make connections with, with, with youth there. Uh, I think it's definitely a... Um, 
a challenge. You know, how do we get more younger folks out there? What can we do to create a, create a space that they feel um, welcome to come down? And I'm hoping with our connections with some of the folks that work with uh, um, Yes or Terrace Youth, that they'll they'll get an introdu introduction through through some formal uh, channels, and then they'll feel that this is maybe something that they, that's theirs. They can feel that they can come down and bring their friends too. So um, that's that's sort of our thing. Um, but yeah, speaking of youth, you know, inviting Hannah to come on out and work with us has certainly brought uh, brought some young, um, um, energetic, strong people to the farm. Yeah, I think you you covered the bases. I mean, I think yeah. just, you know a huge part of our work is intentionally cultivating that young black leadership and and giving them that responsibility and and trusting them with it has been. I mean, that's been one of the most amazing things for me is is just not um, sort of the lack of hesitation to give me responsibility if I'm willing to take it on. Um, then I feel empowered to to make decisions and to be a part of this work and that I'm valued. And, and that's not always the case um, with like young people of color in Seattle. Like we don't always feel that sort of value in the work and, and that our and that our lived experiences are are valuable to the work that we do. And so I think, you know, I want to thank Ray for creating that space and um, yeah, I would say, you know, always pay people if you can and partner with uh, schools because then those kids can get credit for it. Or, um, you know, a lot of high schoolers also get volunteer hours. So we encourage folks to, to share that with their students. We've had teachers say like, oh, like, can I share this opportunity with my students? And I'm like, of course, yeah, so, yeah. Fantastic. I so appreciate that there are so many inroads into participation and that this, you know, this, this focus on empowerment and inclusion is really just coming through in the presentation and in the responses that you just shared. Thank you. And so for my last question, um, I shared with you previously that the students will be creating um, and, and articulating their own food system visions for a more resilient and equitable future. Um, of our food system. And you covered a lot of ground on this already. And I think framed it up, um, framed up your vision, the Black Farmers Collective vision in, in uh, really clear ways. And I, um, I'm just wondering if you have any words that you would like to share, final words you'd like to share with the students in this class and at the University of Washington um, about you know, how they can stay inspired perhaps to keep working toward these visions that they're articulating. Hmm. Um, I, you know, I think in when you're when you're thinking about, um, you know, visioning and a, a lot of times you you constrain yourself right with with what you know. And therefore, that's that the, that vision has to, to fit in in with what you know and, and what's happening now. So and I think I think with students, um, you know, it can be a real good exercise to to not um, to not to try to not limit yourself um, in your vision, right? You to 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 go out there and uh, be as wild and crazy and visionary as you can, and then to maybe say, well, okay, uh, the laws of physics will keep me from actually doing some of this, and you know what what could I what can I what could I actually do as a because if you go too far, then it's too big and you can't take any steps. So to to let yourself free to vision, but then to come back to to what actually can you do and, and then try to actually do it right. Try to make a few steps, I think, would is my, you know, my suggestion in this in this visioning thing. I know we can't you know, we, we uh, do depend on a large industrial food system, but I think individually we can start to chip away a bit at that um, with our buying choices and, um, and, and, and with our action choices and how we actually, uh, um, you know, spend our time, right? And, and if some of our time can be less spent um, um, entertaining ourselves or being entertained uh, and more time uh, improving our lives and, uh, and finding the, 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 um, 
you know, joy and connection, and it might not be on the land, but it might be trying to deliver food. It might be doing all sorts of things that 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 are needed for our communities to try to uh, be more connected and therefore uh, be more healthy. Thanks. Good luck, students. Yeah, I mean, you know, I just want to second everything that Ray said. I think that yeah, just allowing yourself to see many, uh, you know, pathways to your vision and and take on um, more than maybe you think is possible uh, with, you know, limits for your self care and community care, um, I think is really important. Um, we don't want anybody to get burnt out because that's super easy to do. Um, but yeah, I think I, I deeply encourage folks to think about the value of like doing community work and and how it's really generative. It brings a lot of um, really amazing relationships and and opportunities to not just connect with the land and and new types of knowledge, but um, just like sort of help you expand your vision as you keep talking to people who are on the ground doing this work. Um, so yeah, I say you know try and do generative work if you can. It's It's been a very beautiful thing to be a part of. And uh, yeah, you got this. Well, I think that is a wonderful place to end. Very inspirational. Thank you so much. Huge round of, of appreciation for coming today by Zoom um, to share your, your expertise and your wealth of insights with our students. Really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Okay, well, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Okay, and good luck. Thank you for having us. All right.